This one's going to be great. Before I do invite Walter on stage, I want to remind you where, what I was giving the concept about as far as being nice, so to speak, but being respected and having principles. Walter blew my mind with a book one time. Actually, about 30 times in that one book. It's called Defending the Undefendable. And if you've not read it, it's a joyous read. Now, he talks about things that are radical that we might have heard before. And he does it in a respectful way. He provides a logical theory as to why it is that gossiping is legal, providing a trade is legal, offering somebody money for something else is legal. So why is it illegal to pay somebody not to gossip, a.k.a. hush money or blackmail? This was a profound argument to me. I couldn't believe that I was actually thinking about this. It made, made sense to me. And I looked at the title and I looked at who it was. Wow, this man is a respected professor. Teaches Loyola. Loyola. Walter Block is one of the most respected people in our field. He's an economist and he is a prolific writer. And I encourage you to read everything that he's provided because, man, it is smart, keen, and it is polite. And it will reach people. Well, I hope that Walter will reach us tonight. Everyone, please help me welcome Walter Block. I hate introductions like that. That means I'm going to have to be good. <laughs> I've been told that I have a half hour to speak and then 15 minutes for Q&A. And I want to do four things. First, I want to talk about what is libertarianism. Then I want to apply it to two divisive issues. One is immigration, the other is abortion. And then I want to explain why it is that we have so few people here, why it is that Tim is not the Prime Minister of Canada. And I why? think it's, I'm sorry? Why? I don't understand. Well, I'll, exp <laughs> <laughs> I'll explain. Okay. And I will explain it on the basis of sociobiology. So those are the four things I want to do. First, what is libertarianism? I think libertarianism is sort of like a three-legged stool. One is the non-aggression principle. Keep your mitts to yourself. Don't be grabbing other people or their property without their permission. It's OK to use violence in self-defense or if it's agreed upon. If um, uh, uh, Victor and I agree to be in a boxing match and he punches me in the jaw, I can't say assault and battery because I've agreed to be punched above the belt. <laughs> Sadomasochism is OK. Um, it, well, it's not OK, but it's, uh, it shouldn't be against the law. And libertarianism is a theory of what the law should be. And the law should be that if you adhere to the non-aggression principle, well, then you're OK. And if you don't, then you should be considered a criminal and punished. The second uh, stool, or the second leg of this three-legged stool, is uh, private property rights. Because I said you, you're not supposed to be grabbing other people or their property. But how do we know whose property it is? Suppose I grab uh, uh, this chair and I walk out with this chair. Um, did I commit a crime? Well, it depends upon who owns the chair. And we also have a theory as to who owns what. And it's based on the Lockean, John Lockean, Rothbardian theory of homesteading. Namely, you mix your labor with the land, you get to put in a crop, and um, somebody else domesticates a cow, and um, you own the, the, um, the corn, he owns the milk, and now you trade and you each own the other thing even though you didn't produce it, but you can trace it back to voluntary trade and homesteading of virgin territory. The third leg of this three-legged stool is free association. Nobody should be compelled to associate with anyone else against his will. All association should be voluntary. No one should be forced to. The only problem with rape is that the victim doesn't want to associate with the rapist. The only problem with slavery is that the, the slave doesn't want to associate with the master. If you could quit at any time, if you didn't have to interact with somebody, well, then slavery and um, um, rape would be uh, rendered into voluntary sadomasochism and um, voluntary sexual intercourse. So those are the three, leg, uh, three legs of the three-legged stool. And now I want to talk about um, the ball players. Who is a libertarian and, and what percentage of people are? Now, uh, Tim and Victor and I are sort of like the three amigos. We can't sing, or at least I can't sing. I don't know about those those guys, but 
we've done this before many a time, and we're, we're very friendly, and we're all anarchists. And you might get the mistaken impression that libertarianism is almost synonymous with anarchism. I would say, based on just the rough approximation, that maybe 5% of people who are libertarians are anarchists, and maybe the, the rest, 30% uh, each, or maybe 10% tops, and then the other three groups, 30% uh, each, would be minarchists with Ayn Rand and Robert Nozick, armies, courts, and police, but not armies to go exporting democracy, just armies to defend the country. Police not to uh, put uh, victimless criminals in jail because they're not really criminals if they do voluntary sex or drugs, but real criminals, and the third, courts. So I think maybe 30% of libertarians are like that, and another 30% are like uh, constitutionalists, like Ron Paul. And I put this a little lower because in addition to armies, courts, and police, the Constitution in the U.S. Uh, provides for um, uh, post offices and post roads, and I, I favor privatizing roads and, and post offices. And then the third level down, or the fourth level down, anarchists, minarchists, constitutionalists, I would call classical liberals, people like Milton Friedman and Friedrich Hayek, uh, who are libertarians, but you know they allow a lot more government than the other, t uh, the other three uh, uh, positions. So that's sort of what is libertarianism and who are the libertarians. Now let me apply it to first uh, the question of immigration. Now immigration and abortion, which I'll get to in a bit, are very divisive issues, not only among libertarians, but also among the general public. There are people, uh, Hans Hoppe, Murray Rothbard, who think we should not have open immigration we should have a limited immigration, and the people who immigrate into the country, whether it's Canada or the United States, should be, have to pass certain criteria, namely uh, uh, employable and uh, have a certain amount of money, not likely to fall into welfare, not likely to be a criminal, etc. On the other hand, you have people like Bumper Hornberger, who is running for the um, candidate for uh, libertarian uh, party in the US who is uh, favoring open immigration. And what you'll find is the people who favor limited immigration think that the immigrants are really bad guys. And the people who favor open immigration are people who think that immigrants are great guys, or at least they're no worse than the extant population. And there have been surveys that the immigrants are uh, committing less crimes than the average person. Again, I'm, my statistics here are from the United States, not from Canada, but there are similarities. I take a different position. I take the open borders position, but I think that a lot of um, uh, immigrants are really bad guys, especially the people from the Arab countries. They come to Germany. They come to Sweden. And uh, they'll rape a woman who isn't wearing a... Um, a uh, hador or something, a kerchief or something like that, or wearing a miniskirt. They think that if you wear a miniskirt, then this is sort of an open invitation or, or it's punishment to be raped to show you you shouldn't wear a miniskirt. And uh, a lot of women in Sweden are now afraid to go out uh, in public with, you know, uh, dressed the way they would like to dress. And I think they have a right to dress exactly the way they want to. I remember one time I was reading um, about, uh, I'm Jewish, and there were Jews in, this was, oh, 1939, 38, somewhere. There's a whole bunch of Jews wanting to come into Canada to escape Hitler. And the prime minister at the time was asked, how many will you accept? And he said, none is too many. And as a Jew, I was sort of perturbed by this. But then I realized, you know, yes, there's Milton Friedman and there's Murray Rothbard and there were a few other good Jews, but most Jews are a bunch of pinko commies. And, and who wants them? I don't want them. I mean, they're labor leaders, they're socialists, you know, they're, they're uh, very bright, but they're evil. So I could see the, you know, the argument uh, to, you know, keep them all out because you can't distinguish uh, among, between the good ones and the bad ones. So why then am I for open immigration? Because I am more a libertarian than I am... Uh, an open or a closed border person. Namely, I, I have this vision of libertarianism through these eyeglasses, and I want to apply libertarianism to everything, without exception. And I offer you the following scenario. Somebody comes from Mars, or Africa, or India, somewhere, 
and what he does is he comes to the middle of, um, I don't know, Alaska, or the middle of uh, the Northwest Territories. He comes in with a, with a helicopter, and he starts homesteading virgin territory. Did he commit a crime? Well, not according to libertarianism. Yes, the U.S. or the Canadian government claims that land, but their claim is invalid because we said, or at least to my satisfaction, what we said is that the, the essence of libertarianism, one of the three legs of that three-legged stool, is um, homesteading virgin territory. And then there's a lot of virgin territory out there that's never been touched by human hands or feet. So what crime did anyone commit when he just takes a helicopter or he's a good pole vaulter or somehow he, or he takes a boat and, and on the shore of Alaska or um, uh, uh, Canada and he starts homesteading land. He didn't commit a crime. Therefore, to stop him and put him in jail or kick him out or to use violence against him is a violation of the libertarian principles. Now, Hans Hoppe, who uh, takes the limited uh, immigration position, he says, well, uh, the U.S. government or the Canadian government claims it in behalf of all the Canadian citizens or all the American citizens. And I say, well, it's a strange argument for an anarchist like Hans Hoppe to take. And I also say, but the U.S. government or the Canadian government didn't homestead this stuff. There's vast territories out there in the middle of Alaska that had never been touched by anyone, not even Eskimos, nobody. So if somebody comes from Mars or, or Africa or India or uh, South America or wherever, and he plunks himself in the middle of the land and starts homesteading and putting in a crop, it's very un inhospitable uh, land. But still, if he starts doing it, he hasn't committed a crime. He's a victimless criminal. And I'm not ready to eschew libertarianism. I'm not, look, I fear uh, immigrants. A lot of them are bad guys. Even if they're good guys, do we really want one billion Chinese to come to this country? Well, a lot of people wouldn't want that, or a billion Indians, or a billion Martians. How about a trillion of them? Plenty of room. I mean, suppose there were Martians, they were nice guys, there were a trillion of them. Do we really want them here? Well, there, there are a lot of people that don't. But I think it's more important to adhere to libertarianism, because if we uh, eschew libertarianism, if we give up libertarianism, what do we got? We've got nothing. So we have to uh, make the libertarian theory primary. And the libertarian theory being primary says uh, they haven't committed a crime if they come here and they come to virgin territory. Now, it's true they're not going to come to virgin territory. They want to go to Toronto or they want to go to New York or L.A. or somewhere like that. But that's a different issue. The, the point is that they could want to come to virgin territory. Therefore, open borders is the correct position. But how do we have our cake and eat it too? Because not, not only are we libertarians and want to adhere to libertarianism, but we also don't want to be overrun by criminals or even nice guys. So what's the solution? How do we have our cake and eat it? How can we adhere to libertarianism rigorously and also be safe from hordes of uh, uh, people who we don't want here? Privatize every square inch of the land. Now it's true some of this land is submarginal. And nobody really wants it. But, you know, if you don't want them to come in here, let's start privatizing the middle of Alaska or the middle of uh, the Yukon or the middle of the Northwest Territories or parts of British Columbia are totally empty and never been touched. So that would be my solution to the immigration problem. We should have open borders. And if you don't like the um, results of open borders, fine. Privatize every square inch of the country, and then anyone who comes in here is a trespasser, and we kick them out because they're a trespasser, and no longer is it a victimless crime, it's now a victim crime. So that would be my solution. Okay, the next one I want to touch base with you on, the third point. To reiterate, I explain what is libertarianism, at least the way I see it. Then I try to give a solution to the immigration problem. Now I want to try to do the same thing for abortion. Now, abortion is also a very, very divisive issue. There's Murray Rothbard, who is pro-choice. There's Ron Paul, who is pro-life. They're taking a position 180 degrees apart from each other. And yet, you can hardly find two more highly credentialed libertarians than Murray Rothbard and Ron Paul. 
And not only are libertarians divided on this issue, but the general public is very divided. Let me ask you, uh, how many people here are pro-life? How many are pro-choice? That's roughly halfy-halfy, give or take, maybe 60-40, uh, I'm not sure which way. So we here are divided. The general public is divided. The leading libertarians are divided. And I think no one would quarrel with me when I say Murray Rothbard and Ron Paul are leading libertarians. Happily, I have a solution, he said modestly. whoop de doo <laughs> <laughs> And the solution is a thing called evictionism. Now, the pro-life people say that you can't evict and you can't kill. Now, you have to distinguish between evicting a fetus. Uh, I'm now going to make believe that I'm, I'm pregnant. Uh, by the way, men can be pregnant. I don't care what, the, what you people say. And, and my, proof of that is, my proof of that is Arnold Schwarzenegger got pregnant in one of his movies. So here I am. I now have this person inside of me. And uh, I think that this person, especially in the case of rape, is a trespasser. Now, it's an innocent trespasser. The baby is innocent. The father, the rapist, was a bad guy. But the baby is innocent. Well, suppose somebody's in your house. And uh, let's say he's drugged, and he's brought into your house, and you open your door, and now you find him. Can you kill him? Yes. No, you can't kill him. That, that would be a violation of uh, libertarian uh, non-aggression principle. Can you evict him? Do you have to keep him in your house forever or for nine months? No, you can evict him. You can say, you know, please leave. So what I'm trying to say is that we have to distinguish between killing and evicting. The pro-life people say you can do neither. The pro-choice people say you can do both. I say you can just do one but not the other. So it's sort of a compromise solution. And I think it's a principled compromise. What do I mean by a principal compromise? If I say 2 plus 2 is 4, and you say 2 plus 2 is 6, a compromise is that 2 plus 2 is 5. But it's not a principal compromise, because there's nothing from which you can deduce that 2 plus 2 equals 5, except that it's a compromise. And there's no principle underlying it. But there is a principle underlying evictionism. And the principle is private property rights. I mean, we have to adhere to libertarianism. And, and the essence of libertarianism, uh, the non-aggression principle and private property rights are sort of two sides of the same coin. The one goes with the other. Well, you can evict, but you can't kill. In the case of rape, it's very clear that that baby is a trespasser. Can you kill the innocent trespasser? No. Can you evict? Yes. If we, you see, right now uh, in the US and, and in Canada, uh, the abortion law is such that anyone can have an abortion anytime they want. So we have a pro choice society in Canada and in the United States. That means that no babies are safe. If you're a pregnant woman or a pregnant man, you can kill that baby. And I think that that is murder. So if we adopt evictionism, what we do in one fell swoop is we safeguard all uh, one third of babies. Because right now, with present me medical technology, in the seventh, eighth, and ninth months, if you evict the baby, the baby is viable outside of the womb. So what I'm saying is you should have the right to evict at any time. It's true that in the first two trimesters, the baby will die. And in the third trimester, the baby will live as long as the mother can only evict but not abort. Because I think abortion equals eviction plus killing. It's very similar with uh, labor unions. What's the uh, libertarian view on labor unions? Well, if labor unions do one thing, they are legitimate. If they do a second thing, they're not legitimate. What's the one thing that they can do that is legitimate? They can quit en masse. You can't quit. You're a slave. And just because one person quits doesn't mean other people can't quit. So if, if I'm the employer and you guys are my employees and you all quit at one time, that's a pretty powerful tool that the labor union has, and you have a right to do it. But then the labor union does something else. What the labor union does also is it tries to keep scabs out 
and it tries to surround my, my uh, factory and not allow raw materials in or goods out or replacement workers that they call scabs. I'm not sure why that's not hate speech. It seems pretty hateful to me to call people that want to compete for your jobs. And they're not your jobs because jobs are not owned by an individual. They're an amalgamation of an agreement between two people. So we libertarians distinguish between quitting, which unions have a right to do, and blockading and preventing other people from uh, taking, you know, competing for those jobs. And in a similar matter, manner, I think we should also distinguish between evicting and killing. They're two very different things, even though they sometimes go together in most people's minds. But we have to train ourselves to see a difference between them because there is a difference. Now, if in my heart of hearts, I'm pro-life. I believe that every life is precious, not just black lives. Black lives are precious. Black lives are important, but all lives are important. The next baby could be a Mozart or a Rothbard. Every life is precious. But more important to me than life being precious is libertarianism. I'm, I'm really a libertarian fanatic. I, I don't want to make any compromises with libertarianism. I want to use libertarian. I have like, sort of like a horse with blinders. Just libertarianism. That's all I see is libertarianism. And I want to use it to solve all sorts of problems, one of which is abortion. Now, it just so happens that at today's medical technology, only one third of babies will be saved if we adopt evictionism. But as medical technology improves, probably in 10 or 20 years, babies not only in the seventh, eighth, and ninth month, but also in the sixth month will be saved. And then in the fifth month, you know that in 5,000 years, if we don't blow ourselves up first, Every baby will be viable outside of the womb in a test tube, a super duper test tube. So if we adopt evictionism, again, eventually we pro-life people will win. But that's uh, peripheral. That's just pragmatic. The key is we should adopt evictionism because it's right, because it's just, because it's libertarian. Okay, the last thing I want to do on my list, I said I would do four things. One, what is libertarianism? Two, immigration. Three, abortion. I want to try to explain why Tim is not the Prime Minister of Canada. And why we have here, what, 30 people, 25 people? Why don't we have uh, 20,000 people or a million people listening to this sort of stuff? And we would if we had a free enterprise society. Why don't we? And my explanation is sociobiology. So what is sociobiology? What sociobiology is, is a theory that says that we are the way we are now because of what it took a million years ago or a billion years ago, whenever we were in the caves or the trees, I'm not sure when, but a long time ago, what did it mean to stay alive and bring our genetic uh, endowments to the next generation? So let me give you a few examples of sociobiological explanations for why we are the way we are. How many people are afraid of snakes here? I'm afraid of snakes. I mean, you know, you see a big snake, you know, you take something, you try to bash it, or you shoot it, or you get up on a chair. How many people are afraid of bathtubs? One weirdo over there. <laughs> Nobody's afraid of bathtubs. Sh shut up. Nobody's afraid of bathtubs. <laughs> Why is it? Milton Friedman, by the way, was killed by a bathtub. He was in 93, he was taking a shower, he slipped, he hit his head on the side of the bathtub on his way to the hospital, unfortunately he perished. More people nowadays die from bathtubs than from snakes. Little kids, you, you, you know, they'll, they'll go like this to you see a snake, they're afraid. Why? Because a million years ago, if you were afraid of a bathtub, did that help you uh, live more, uh, lead more of your genetic endowment to the next generation? No, there were no, no such things as bathtubs. On the other hand, if you weren't afraid of snakes, you probably didn't leave as many children to the next generation as you would have had you been afraid of snakes. If you go up and pat the snake and say, hi, snakey, how are you doing? You, you're not going to leave too many children to the next generation. So that would be one example of sociobiology. Another example of uh, sociobiology is uh, when a baby cries, we, uh, we get upset. Look, suppose there were two uh, tribes. They had the same opposable thumb, the same power, the same brains. Only one uh, was 
baby cries, you don't care. Yeah, let the baby cry. The other one, baby cries, you, you get a little upset. You try to pat the baby or give them milk or something. Well, which tribe is going to leave more uh, genetic material to the next generation? Obviously, the one that worries about babies crying. Right? And we are, we are the, uh, uh, the grandchildren of people who were worried about babies. We are the grandchildren of people who were afraid of snakes. Let me give you just one more example. Women who want to play the sexy part in the movies usually are 22, 25, 30 tops. You get to be 35 or 40, even though you're very beautiful, all of a sudden you're the mother or the grandmother when you're 60, and they're beautiful. I'm 78. I see a 60-year-old woman who looks like a young kid to me, but, you know, they're... But all of a sudden, they can't, they, can't, they can't get the ingenue parts anymore. Why is it? Why is it? Well, again, there were these two tribes. And one tribe, that's our tribe, they see a 22-year-old girl, and they say, whoop de doo let me at her. They see a 60-year-old woman, and they say, oh, you know, <laughs> not interested. And there's this other tribe that sees a 60-year-old woman and says, whoop de doo that's great. 22-year-old girl, eh, not ripe yet. Which one is going to leave more children? Obviously, the one that looks at 22-year-old girls as sex objects and is interested in uh, engaging with them in uh, sexual activities. And we are the children of people who happen to be that way. Let me just give you one more example. Why are we disgusted with incest? Why, when you think of the idea of going to bed with your mother or your daughter or something like oh. that, you're just sort of a little nervous about that. Well, because if you were interested in incest, you didn't leave as many children as you would if you weren't interested in that. Okay, now how do we apply that to economics? <laughs> I didn't think that was funny, but... <laughs> no, I'm sorry, I'm just laughing at something. Okay. How do we apply that to economics? When I get freshman students in my class and I tell them about the minimum wage law, they think it's very callous. They think, you know, that if you're against the minimum wage law, you, you must be against high wages for poor people. Uh, in New Orleans, we had this um, uh, Katrina, and um, after Katrina, there was um, uh, uh, high prices and, and uh, price gouging. They called it price gouging. Now, we who know a little bit about economics know that the reason we had price gouging is the supply curve shifted way to the left and the demand curve didn't move at all. People wanted the same amount of uh, uh, baby diapers and orange juice and, and chicken as before, but now uh, New Orleans was cut off and you couldn't bring that stuff in, so the prices really rose. And we know that the benefits of high prices, namely price gouging, are two. One, uh, people from um, uh, here, people from Vancouver, are more likely to have only two motives to uh, bring stuff to New Orleans. One is um, benevolence, and the other is making a profit. And what we want to do is harness all human emotions to help the people in New Orleans. Um, secondly, think of uh, the first 300 people that go into the Walmart, at the old prices, they're going to grab up 20 gallons of orange juice because they don't know where the next orange juice is coming from. But if the price is uh, 10 times higher, they're going to act more amenable. They're going to act more reasonably. They'll only take a gallon or two or a, a bottle or two, and they'll leave some from other people. So we know that high prices have a salutary effect when there's a shortage. But the freshman kids in my classes every year, they're disgusted by this. Why? Because we were brought up a million years ago when we were in the caves or the trees in what size groups? About this size, maybe 25, maybe 30 people with cousins and uncles and aunts and people like that. And you shared. If you didn't share, you were kicked out of the tribe and you didn't leave as many children uh, if you were on your own. So we have this idea you see, a lot of people say, well, the reason we, we don't believe in free enterprise is because of um, uh, the universities or because of Hollywood or because of the pulpit or because of um, the newspapers or something like that. And that's true. The culture has been taken over by the left. But we have to go deeper than that. We have to say, well, why is it that they're that way? And the reason that they're that way is because of sociobiology. We are mutants. We are weirdos. Not that we started out as libertarians, but at least we were open to libertarianism, which is weird because most people are not open to it. 
most people are just not open to libertarianism. You can uh, say this and say that. And, and um, uh, I mean, Ron Paul did beautifully. Tim does beautifully. Victor does beautifully. All of us do beautifully here. But it's sort of like the rock of Sisyphus. We're pushing the rock up, and then the rock comes down. We're pushing it up, and it comes down. OK, so that's my thesis. What happened was a colleague of mine, John Lavender, said, but you're wrong. Because we go back to, um, not the cavemen, but, uh, and not a million years ago, but we go back 10,000, 20, 30,000 years ago, and we find groups of people, again, living uh, maybe 25 people, 30 people, and they have 3,000 um, pots. Well, they have 4,000 uh, spears. From this, we deduce that they traded. So my thesis is wrong. And then we had a third co-author who said, he was a biologist, and he said, you're both right. And what he said is, yes, yes, uh, we are also hardwired, biologically disposed toward barter and trucking and, and trading, as Adam Smith said in his uh, Wealth of Nations. But this is very superficial. It's only 10,000, 20,000 years ago. You go back to when we were, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, mammals, practically, when we were uh, monkeys or whatever we were before we became human beings. And it's much more deep. In other words, we have some tendencies to be open to trade and, and uh, fair trade or whatever. But much more deeply our, uh, in our psyches or in our biology, in our hard wiring, is antipathy to the free enterprise system. I'm out of time. Thanks for your attention. <laughs> Questions, comments? Yes, sir. Um, no. Walter, first yep. of all, great presentation. Thank you. Um, Going back to your earlier point about privatizing land and homesteading, what's to prevent somebody from going, you know, to Alaska, you know, the shores of Alaska and saying, "This is all going to be mine." puts you know, puts down a stake here, and go, you know, five miles deep this way, you know, four miles this way, and says, "This is all mine," and you know, takes off back to Vancouver. You know, how are you going to prevent people from abusing that kind of system? Okay, the question is, how, how can we prevent people from abusing it? In other words, the, the first white man comes here and says, I own the whole kit and caboodle. Yeah. Or he puts four flags, one in Maine, one in the U.S., or in Labrador, and one in uh, Vancouver, and says, I own the, the whole kit and caboodle of Canada. Well, there's a whole literature on this, namely, how intensive does the farming have to be? Do you have to plant a corn plant every in square inch, every square foot, every square yard, every acre, every uh, square mile? What? And what Murray Rothbard says is it all depends upon the culture and, and the geography. East of the Mississippi, again in the US, it's fertile. So you don't need that much land. You need 160 acres for a family of four. West of the Mississippi, you need uh, more because it's less fertile. And if you're in uh, the um, uh, desert, you need even more. And if you're in Alaska, you need even more. When we go to the moon, how people already went to the moon. Well, how much of the moon do they own? Well, a little bit more than, than the desert the, uh, the desert or, or the tundra. But it has to be reasonable. In other words, it has to be linked up with, with the culture, with the homesteading, with the farming practices. So the answer to that would be it's sort of a, a gray area. It's a continuum. It's a continuum problem. You know what a continuum problem is? That's what should the um, uh, uh, statutory rape age be? If you go to bed with a five-year-old girl, even if she agrees, we don't think you, that she's capable of agreeing to any such thing, so you're a rapist, a statutory rapist. She agreed, so you're not a real rapist. But you're a statutory rapist. You go to bed with a 25-year-old woman, and we think she's capable of agreeing to go to bed with you. You're not a statutory rapist. So where do you put the line? 15 years old, 16, 17, 14? Any point that you pick, somebody could say, well, how about one month older, one month younger? Or I'm about to punch you now. Are you uh, entitled to pick out a, a shoot a, pull out your gun and shoot me in self-defense? No. In this context, you know, I'm not going to punch you. It's ridiculous. On the other hand, if it's a dark alley and the light is glinting off my watch and, and you don't know whether it's a knife or not and you shoot me, then you are. But there's a continuum problem. You can't say, well, the, the fist has to be this far away from the nose, then you can take um, uh, action against. And you can't say what the statutory rape age is. Nobody can say, you know, it's 15 years and seven months. It's silly. You have to, there are gray areas. Libertarianism can't give you an exact answer to everything. So my answer to you is it's a continuum problem, but you have to have some sort of reasonableness. 
And the reasonableness would be, well, how do other people in Alaska deal with it? How much land do they need to keep a family of four going? Well, that's how much you could have. Question, comment, more? Yes, sir. I have a question. The question is on the concept of libertarianism. Uh, you, you, to me, you have the best definition ever for libertarianism. Thank you. And what it is. But my question is, how, how come you have this definition that's so uh, principled, and then you go and call uh, people like Gary Johnson libertarian? Uh, why? Why if he's not principled, he does not respect the private property, how come he be considered as a libertarian by you? Uh, the question was, I gave a very good uh, explanation of what libertarianism is, but yet I'm allowing Gary Johnson to be called a libertarian. Well, Murray Rothbard used to have this uh, uh, expression, every dog gets one bite. I say every dog gets five bites. I mean, you know, if we want to talk about what libertarianism, everybody, you don't have to be an anarchist to be a libertarian. Hayek compromised all over the place. Milton Friedman compromised all over the place. Gary Johnson was a little weak on, on many things. He stepped on his tongue a few times. He didn't know uh, where, where some city in Aleppo was. He didn't know what Aleppo was. He thought that, um, uh, what is it, that the Christian baker ought to be compelled to bake a cake for the gay people? You know, he just misunderstood libertarianism. But, but you know, he's, he's a libertarian. I mean, if you're going to consider Hayek and... If you're going to consider Hayek and Milton Friedman libertarians, you have to consider Gary Johnson uh, a libertarian. Uh, I mean, otherwise, you know, it'll just be you and I, and I'm not so sure about you, and I'm not sure about me, you know. Uh, unless everyone agrees with me on everything, they're not a libertarian. I, that's one way to look at it. But I'm, I'm more of an, a big tent libertarian. I think Gary Johnson is a libertarian. I mean, I used to call Milton Friedman a commie. I still call him a commie. I was, was once in a debate with him over private roads, and he said, we have to have socialist roads. So I called him a road socialist. <laughs> and and uh, he didn't much like that. But he is a road socialist. And then a friend of mine, Bill Bourne, I said, well, under whose um, uh, rule would you rather live under? Um, uh, 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 Milton Friedman or uh, Hillary Clinton? <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> now Milton Friedman is great. It, it's a matter of comparison. You know, there's this joke, the economist was asked, how is your wife? And the answer was, compare to what? <laughs> well, Gary Johnson, compare to who? To compare to Justin Trudeau? He's really good. Okay, so he's a little weak. He's not as perfect as, as, as he should be. None of us is as perfect as they should be. We all make mistakes. He made a few mistakes. But I regard him as a libertarian. Not a good one, not excellent. Ron Paul was way, way better. But still, he's in the fourth or the lowest level of libertarianism, which I call classical liberal. So I defend calling him a libertarian, even though we all disagree with a lot of what he said. I got a question, Walter. Shoot, so to speak. If I were a Prime Minister of Canada, what I would do is I would compromise a little and say, hey, look, I'm going to uh, open all the borders. Unless every square inch of Canada is uh, homesteaded, go out there and start homesteading. Otherwise, we're going to be overrun by hordes of um, people, and I'll give you one year to do it, and th that would be a compromise. Because we've got a lot of homeless people on the street here, and, we, and there's a lot of immigration coming in here illegally. Um, I've been following a lot of stuff, and would you, again, would you actually close the borders to these criminals? I certainly would uh, close the borders, uh, not close the borders, but I would allow people like Hans Hoppe to come in or, you know, uh, people who were, had money or had a job or were a doctor or a plumber or uh, people like that. Uh, but I would have uh, limited immigration if every bit of Canada was privately owned. But if every bit of Canada wasn't privately owned, I would be violating libertarian principle. I said, you can't come in here, you can't homestead this virgin territory. I would just say, let's get rid of virgin territory. My motto is, if it moves, privatize it. If it doesn't move, privatize it. Since everything either moves or doesn't move, you privatize everything. I've got three books in my privatization series. We should privatize highways, privatize oceans, and privatize the space race and, and moon and Mars. So my answer to you, if I were prime minister, I'd, I'd be the uh, assistant prime minister to, uh, uh, to Tim Moen, and I think, uh, the correct libertarian view is let's privatize the, the country, uh, 
And then we pick and choose who we want in here because if they come in without our permission, they're trespassing okay, because one, everything one, is open. One more question, I'll add to that. Sure. We got a lot of homeless people on the street here. And um, what do you think about the homeless shelters in Toronto costing the taxpayer $20 million a month for these refugees okay. when, when we have homeless people breathing uh, in problems? The question is we have a lot of homeless people. Um, uh, what do we do about it? Yeah, if I could put it. What do we do about it? Do we still like Trudeau right. want to give them free drugs? I agree with treatment centers. I agree with basically trying to get these people help, mental health, because I suffer from a lot of mental health issues that I've been seeing a lot of things, and it's sickening how this country is turning into a mental health hospital. Yeah. 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 He was uh, very much against mental illness. Uh, nobody is mentally ill. Before, in the good old days, or in, in a different day, a lot of these people would be in mental institutions against their will because they would harm themselves or harm other people. Like Trudeau should be in a mental health institution. Well, that's, that's another issue about <laughs> Trudeau. Uh, so w one answer, I think, is to legalize drugs. If all drugs were legal, I mean, we just had this thing in Mexico where they shot up a bunch of uh, Mormons, uh, uh, women and children, which is pretty despicable. And, and, they, uh, and they, uh, the drug gangs, the cartels fight the Mexican uh, army on equal uh, terms. Well, if we legalized all those drugs, we would take the wind out of the sails of, of these criminals. And they're not just in Mexico. They're in the US. They're in Canada. They're everywhere. So if we legalized drugs, that would be part of the solution. If we got rid of the minimum wage law, a lot of these people could become employable. Right, right now, they're not employable. Okay. So the, I think the solution to the homeless problem is, first of all, whenever there's a problem, it's government. Yeah. If, if, you know, if there's any problem, the weather, it's because uh, uh, you know, it, you know, it rains at very inconsiderate times. Uh, I, I do uh, half marathons, I do race walking, and it rains during the day. We should have it rain at, at you know two to four in the morning or something like that. And you know whose fault that is that we don't have it? The government, because if if they didn't take half the GDP away from mm -hmm. us, we'd be twice as rich. And if they didn't use their half of the GDP to uh, regulate the crap out of us, we'd be four times as rich. And if we were four times as rich, we'd probably cure cancer and, and uh, have the weather conditions a lot better. And we'd solve all sorts of problems. So the government is, is the big problem. I'm yes, sorry sir. to take your guys' time away, but before I can. Yes, sir. Uh, Unemployment isn't really a problem because when it comes to the socialists, the, uh, the centralized state, they kind of treat it like, oh, we need to get rid of unemployment. But the thing is, people just choose to not work because there are the jobs available. So my main question is, is unemployment like really a problem that we need to take away? Like, what, what's the solution on that? Well, the question is, what do we do about unemployment? And again, it's government that's creating it by boosting wages above uh, productivity levels. Uh, whether it's by unions or minimum wages or, or other ways like that. Uh, then the question is, comes, well, you know, uh, will the robots take over all our jobs and we'll have vast unemployment? And the answer is no, because human, uh, this is sometimes called the lump of labor fallacy, namely there's only so much work to do and if the, uh, if the robots do it, then there'll be less left for us. But uh, human desires are, I won't say infinite, but indefinitely large. We want the sun, the moon, and the stars. I, I want to be able to go to Pluto in one minute. I want no more cancer. I want to live forever. Uh, it, it, that takes a lot of work. You know, there's always going to be some work to be done. So we don't have to worry about that. Uh, so I don't, I don't think there's any problem that's not caused by government. And I think in equilibrium, there would be zero unemployment. So. Yes. Do you think we should see it as that way, or is that, oh, unemployment's going to exist some way, somehow, kind of like, you know, free 
No, I, I don't agree with Milton on this one. I think he was a great economist on many issues. You know, he sort of uh, embodies Murray Rothbard's rule, namely people specialize in what they're worst in. Milton Friedman was great on minimum wage and unemployment and um, uh, free trade and rent control. And what does he specialize in? Money, where he's horrible. And then uh, the voucher system, where he's also very bad. Uh, I think there is a problem of unemployment. There are people, look, the unemployment rate for young black males is quadrupled the unemployment rate for uh, adult white males. Quadruple. The black unemployment rate is twice as much as the, um, uh, the white unemployment, and the um, middle-aged unemployment is half as much as the teenage unemployment. So black teen uh, kids are quadruple uh, unemployment rate. That's a problem. Because then, you know, you, you can't get a job and you get bored and you get into crime and, and the police have got more guns than you and you've got this problem in the U.S. where the, the black incarceration rate is through the roof. So I think unemployment is a, a, a big problem and I think it's caused by government. And if government wouldn't cause it, there would be zero unemployment in equilibrium. We're never in equilibrium, but we're always tending toward equilibrium. So there might be a, a little unemployment, but you know, if you're in between jobs and you take six months to look for a job, you're not unemployed. Or if you're on vacation or something like that, you're not unemployed. Unemployment means involuntary uh, unemployment. Then you have this thing called the discouraged worker effect. You're unemployed, you're unemployed, and now all of a sudden you leave the labor force. You're not counted as unemployed anymore, so the unemployment rate goes down, even though the unemployment uh, problem is, 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 is worse. We've only got uh, two or three more minutes. Uh, one more question or comment? Yes, sir. Can you speak louder? I can't hear you. What's the best way to communicate these issues on a larger scale? There is no one right way. I ask, who are the two most successful people in converting people to libertarianism? And I come up with Ayn Rand for my generation and um, uh, Ron Paul for the next generation. And yet they were the opposite. Ron Paul is a sweetie pie. He's a gentle, nice guy. Ayn Rand, you call her a sweetie pie, she'll kick you in the, in the crotch or something. I mean, she was nasty. And yet she was very successful. So what I get from that as an Austrian subjectivist economist is there's no one right way. Everybody should do it their own way, whichever way is the most fun for you. If the most fun for you is running for political office, run for political office. If the most fun for you is uh, setting up a, um, a, a Rothbard Institute, uh, or I won't say a Fraser Institute, I used to work for them and I got fired for being too libertarian. So that, but, but you know, compared to what? The Fraser Institute is pretty good compared to uh, you know, a lot of other groups. Uh, if your uh, most fun is, um, uh, I don't know, uh, 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 going to speak to a uh, uh, businessmen's club, whatever it is that you enjoy, the promotion of libertarianism should be fun. We're, we're supposed to have fun doing this. Even though we're not going to succeed because of sociobiology, it's still fun. And I can't imagine doing anything else. I mean, it's just the most glorious thing. It's, it's even better than a baby smile or Mozart or a uh, sunset. Libertarianism is glorious. It, it's the, the best thing since sliced, even better than sliced bread. So uh, even though I'm giving a, a case for pessimism, I'm very optimistic. I'm, I'm very happy doing libertarianism. And, and there can't be anything better than promoting liberty. Yes, sir. This question is for Tim. Um, I was going to ask you, what do you think about the Wexit movement? Oh, you yes. Think, yes. You think yes. That's, a, that's a trend towards you know, libertarianism in a sense that you know, it's a territory that's trying to break away from big government. What is the Wexit? Wexit is a secessionist movement, a Western secessionist. There's a lot of Albertans and Saskatchewanites and some BC, mostly northeastern BC, that is uh, upset with Trudeau. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, I'm a big fan of the Rothbard uh, quote that, listen, if you, if you accept that there shouldn't be a one world government, if you take that as that that, that should neither be the preference, the preferred state of affairs for the world, that there shouldn't be a one world government, and that you accept the fact that nations should be in a state of anarchy with regards to each other without a, a government lording over them, then uh, you can't say that states shouldn't be, shouldn't be able to secede from the nation, that municipalities shouldn't be able to secede from the state, that neighbors shouldn't, neighborhoods shouldn't be able to secede from the municipalities, and that individuals shouldn't be secede from the nation. So as far as I'm concerned, that's one more nation 
towards 8 billion nations, which I think is the preferred, uh, w what I would prefer, uh, ultimately. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's better. Now, I will say this. I, I think that there's, you know, it, it kind of suffers from the same problem as uh, the Yellow Vest movement, right? So it's kind of an anti-establishment movement. It's upset with the current state of affairs, but it, it has no philosophical underpinnings, right? So, so a lot of Wexiteers want uh, socialist health care. They want uh, state-run this and state-run that, and they're, they're not libertarians. But I still think it would be better. Um, decentralizing political power is generally a good thing. Um, and, and I think getting government closer to the people, you know, I, I like to be able to confront my legislator on the street and say, hey, what the hell, dude? Uh, rather than have them far removed in Ottawa. So I think it's a, a trend in the general direction. But, you know, I, I'm hesitant to jump into that because my, my goal is to promote liberty and, and to be a radical for liberty. And um, I just don't see a, a, a way to do that through the Wexit movement, uh, aligning myself with rabid status, if that makes any sense. But, but I applaud, I would applaud uh, secession for sure. Let, let me add to that. Um, I, I think that uh, Catalonia has a right to secede from Spain. Um, uh, Quebec has a right to secede from uh, Canada. Hong Kong has a right to secede from China. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We in the United States had a right to secede from Britain. Yeah. Now, in 1776. Now, sometimes it's successful, sometimes it's not. I fear that what's going on in Hong Kong, the Chinese will overwhelm and, and they won't succeed. But that's a different issue. There are two different issues. One, do you have a right to secede? And, and as Tim says, we have a right to secede down to the individual level. Will you succeed in seceding is a different question. All right, thank you. Um, I am going to actually invoke a, the um, MC's privilege. I'm going to bring up a question that I'm sure that many here have already heard at one point or time or another is you believe in this non-aggression principle and you believe that our society is one that should not have people initiating f force or the threat of force, coercion. Force, fraud, and coercion is something that I hear people say. Now how is it not coercive when I'm going to starve to death and you will offer me substandard wages that are impossible for me to, to live successfully on or potentially grow out, you know, grow of the society, you know, grow out of this particular scenario because I'm living in a situation where life is going to kill me if I don't accept your job. So I'm coerced to accept your job, live your substandard wages and so on. My typical response is, Yes, you weren't put into this situation of your own accord. You did not accept it. And so your parents do have a responsibility to take care of you and prevent you from suffering from this death of starvation and so on. But most of us grow out of having our parents be responsible for us and become adults. <laughs> now, what is your response to that particular question, Walter? It's your turn. What was your oh, oh, do you want to answer that one? Sure. Victor? Yeah. Well, it's the whole case of positive versus uh, negative rights. You know, I'll hold this for the camera's benefit. Yeah, the, um, yeah. The, whole, the whole issue of like, what about the starving person or the janitor, blah, 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 blah. And people, there's a, there's, there's a separate question of uh, people who do not want to necessarily maintain their own existence through their own responsibility. That even, that this policy of a, uni of a universal guaranteed income even especially appeals to those people. And it came out that, uh, yeah, those people would apply for that. It's a ridiculous standard. Most people are healthy in mind and body. Most people, the majority of people, work for a living. Work for a living. There's a small, necessarily small minority of people who are unable to fend for themselves. And if it, was, it wasn't a, a minority, but a majority, it would be a species that can't, that can't survive. But obviously, we do survive. And I don't believe that uh, the benevolence of people is so great that let's say that in a stateless society without a welfare state, et cetera, which is, doesn't aid, it's not like a, 
why uh, fix why fix the clock if it's not broken? You know, the, the, the welfare state there is working. No, it's not working. It's a disaster. It entrenches poverty and, and uh, misfortune. But voluntary voluntary charity would take care of those that small fractionalized of, uh, amount of people in any given society. If it's a civilized industrial so uh, society, of course, uh, would be taken care of. So my, my view of human nature isn't such as that uh, they would just simply fall through the cracks like some Dewar uh, Darwinian social uh, Herbert Spencer hellhole or anything like that. I don't believe that at all. So. Let, let, me just, uh, let me just add to that. Um, I, I'm, I'm a professor at, at a university, Loyola University in New Orleans, and, and they're really against sweatshops there. They, they hate sweatshops. Uh, they think that they're exploiting the workers. You know, they go over to Bangladesh or somewhere and they offer, you know, uh, 10 cents an hour. The, the question is, what were they making before the sweatshop owner came in there? They were probably making 5 cents an hour. And it, if the sweatshop owner didn't offer them a better job, they, they couldn't get any workers. And uh, yet uh, they have these, uh, the lefty students always want to ban sweatshop uh, shirts or pants or whatever it is. or. So uh, I, I think that the I, I think Victor was absolutely right that this is a positive um, uh, obligation, and we libertarians only uh, recognize negative obligations. Don't uh, commit a crime, but you don't have to help other people. And I would say that if you have a society like the libertarian society, you'd have a richer society, and then you'd have less of that sort of problem than if you uh, had one other things equal where you uh, had compulsory um, giving money to the poor. You take money from a rich guy and give it to the poor guy. You take away the incentive of the rich guy to, to be rich, and you take away the incentive of the poor guy to, to do some work, because if he does some work, he'll get less welfare. Uh, sure, I'll add my two cents. So, I mean, the, the only thing I would add to that is most of the people I see that, that are pushing for minimum wage laws or th this narrative that businesses are coercive, have never created a job and have no intention of creating a job. You notice that if someone advocating for a $15 an hour minimum wage isn't saying, you know what I should do? I should start a business, invest my capital, take some risks, do a lot of work and start employing people and paying them a wage I think they should. They are saying other people that are already creating jobs should pay them a wage. And not only am I not going to be the one that's going to go there and coerce those people into paying the wage I think they should be paying, I'm going to ask government some people that aren't me to do it for them. So it's like two layers of personal responsibility removed from solving the problem. And, and this is a large part of the problem I see today in society is that uh, people, people have, they think that spewing their crappy opinion is somehow solving problems. And, they, they ha and what it's doing is virtue signaling and removing them from taking any personal responsibility to solve the problem themselves. And I see this all the time in emergency services. We get 911 calls constantly for people who are reporting fires that they don't even check to make sure they're, they're safe. I, I remember responding once to uh, a three alarm blaze and I, asked, I was going to be the first arriving officer and I asked dispatch, you know, can you give me any updates? Is there any residents at home? The callers say how involved the structure was. And they said, oh, the caller was just driving by and reported that the house looked like it was on fire. They didn't stop. Well, why didn't they stop? Why didn't they take some personal responsibility and just knock on the door and say, hey, your house is on fire, clear <laughs> the house, right? Well, they, because there's a government department that takes care of that, right? I, I have no sense of duty to, oh, by the way, it turned out to be the reflection of the sun in the window. So here we have three fire stations screaming through tr uh, rush hour traffic, causing however many fender benders to get to this house to save some lives, and it turned out to be the reflection of a sun because someone wouldn't take the personal responsibility. The next day, someone witnessed an abdu abduction from the playground, uh, a, a gir little girl screaming as a man hauled her away. Uh, rather than confronting the man, the town was on lockdown as they issued an Amber Alert, only to three hours later discover that it was an uncle forcing the little kid to come home for supper. Okay, just take some personal responsibility, say, hey, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. uh, and and it, it goes down the line. And, and so, um, you know, I, I feel no sense of obligation to my neighbor, which is a sad state of affairs, because I know there's a, a social safety net, a government agency. So I think that the state, I, I'm with Walter here in that the state literally ruins everything. It ruins our sense of community and our sense of social cohesion, because none of us feel any sense of duty or obligation to our fellow man because 
uh, there, there's a government department for that. And a lot of these things, the, the, the sentiment that he uh, has satirized perfectly uh, is evidence of that. So. Excellent. Excellent, excellent. All right, do we have any additional questions? All right, uh, we already did a question from you, right? Um, so we're going to go to the gentleman in the gray. You're doing excellent. This is an item that is very important in my country. So my question is very simple. Do you think that you live in democracy if you don't take in consideration the white vote and the fact that some people remember? Okay. Could you repeat the question about... My question is, do you think that you live in democracy? Yes. The democracy, right. the right of the people, the power for the people, mm -hmm. The what vote? And the fact that some people Did you say white, white vote? The white vote. The white vote. White, vote. White, white skin? Yes. Oh. Okay, so the question is, how can we say that we live in a democracy when there is so many people who don't actually vote, and in particular a very large demographic being white people who are not voting? Oh, blank, uh, uh, a blank ballot. Okay, doing my best to try to handle that one. Yeah, okay, so we're talking about a blank ballot, one that is basically intentionally left absent of any votes. So you've got a blank ballot, and you've got a number of people who do not vote. So how can we call this a democracy? How can we consider it democracy? And... Uh, I'm going to start off with saying is democracy is evil, it's mob rule, but let's see what other people have to say. Okay. Who's next? Sure. Yeah, uh, as, a, as an advocate and, and one who expels this, the possibility of the, the, the making an ethical, ethical case for a stateless society, democracy in this modern statist formation, I have nothing uh, but uh, for contempt for. Um, I, I agree with uh, with Plato that it is mob caprice, <laughs> where it put his beloved Socrates uh, to death because they decided a brilliant man like that who brought a lot to Western civilization, but the mob didn't think he should have the right to live. But you also have a uh, modern society, of course, especially as exemplified in the states, as uh, being uh, you know um, tempered by individual rights. So in this case, the democracy just acts to select. A given politician on certain policies, but in accordance with the Constitution, of course. You know, so we have the, the right to elect our given officials. Uh, it still comes back down to, I, I have all these old expressions, maybe Walter's familiar with them. It's just that uh, democracies like uh, two wolves voting, on, voting uh, with, uh, with one sheep on what to have for dinner that night. You know, so you just have, it's created a, a culture of division where you have the left against the right and all these different uh, ideological factions, conservatives, liberals, fighting and vying for the privilege of the state, either for, to, for further control of their uh, interests at the expense of the other section of the population. And that's what democracies has come to. It's become to like a bully abyss of special interest groups and vying competing ideological factions pitted against one another. <coughs> Uh, can I ask, just out of curiosity, uh, which country are you from? France. France. Uh, I see nothing. Uh, by the way, Hans Hoppe wrote a magnificent book, Democracy, the God That Failed. Yeah. Very, very good book, where he said um, monarchy would even be better than democracy. Not that he favors monarchy. He favors anarchism. But so bad as democracy, that monarchy would be better. Uh, I have nothing wrong with, I have no problem with democracy, provided that everyone agreed to be bound by the vote in the first place. I used to live in a condo uh, up on uh, uh, North Van, and th this condo had all sorts of weird rules, you know, the fences had to be this way, you even had to have curtains in a certain color, and a lot of people were complaining, oh, it's too onerous, but the point is they agreed to it, and, it, and the rules were set up by a democratic vote. 
look, if you have a chess club and we're arguing, should we meet on Tuesday night or Wednesday night, and we've all agreed to be bound by the vote, then there's nothing wrong with democracy. The problem with political democracy is we didn't agree. I, I never signed any contract with the, the US government or the Canadian government that I would be bound by the, the vote of other people. So I agree that is more rule if we don't agree to, it, to be bound by it in the first place. But if we do agree to be bound by it in the first place, then there's nothing wrong with democracy. Tim, can you specifically address the fact that there are so many people who choose not to vote, or when they vote, they vote with a blank vote? Is that something that you think that is not really taken very seriously? Yeah, well, I think a lot of people um, just recognize the fact that their, their vote doesn't amount to much. Um, you know, I certainly haven't, the only time I ever voted in my life was for myself in an election. I mean, I, you know, I, like, I don't know. I, I just didn't see the point. I had beer to drink, I had TV to watch. I'm like, that, that stuff all seemed more important than, than voting, expressing, like, what difference would my vote possibly make um, in an election? And I think a lot of people feel that way. They, they, they just feel helpless. They, they look like society's gonna march on the way it is regardless of whether I express my opinion or not. You know, and then the people that do express their opinion, they get this idea that their opinion matters or something like that. Like, no, your opinion, like, we all think our opinion e matters equally. Well, no, I, you know, I, like in business, at, when I run my business or even at the fire station, um, your opinion doesn't matter unless you agree to be part of the solution, unless you have some skin in the game. And our modern democracy, there's no skin in the game. At least you could say in early democracy, I guess, uh, if you were a taxpayer or you're a net contributor to the nation in some way, then you got to have an opinion. But now everyone gets to have an opinion, regardless of whether they're a net parasite or a net you know, contributor. And uh, you know, I, I just think it's, it doesn't mean anything anymore at all. And it probably never did, but. I'd, I'd like to add a little bit to that, uh, sort of pro-voting. Uh, uh, pro what, I, I was converted to libertarianism by Ayn Rand, and then I met Murray, uh, maybe 1963, and then in 65 I met Murray, Murray Rothbard. And I asked him, how many libertarians are there in the world? And he would be in a position to know, and he said, 25. <laughs> 25 libertarians in the whole world? We have 25 people in this little yeah. room here. Uh, how many libertarians are there now? I would say 25 million thanks to Ayn Rand and Ron Paul and all of us helping in, in all the countries of the world. So we've gone from 25 to 25 million in, in a couple of decades. Despite evolution, yeah. <laughs> Despite <laughs> evolution, right. On the other hand, the critic would say, well, at that time, how many people were there in the world? Three billion. How many people are there in the world now? Seven billion. So when we went from 25 to 25 million, an increase of uh, percentage-wise, gigantic, they went from three billion to seven billion. Namely, they got four, four billion more and we only got 25, minus, 25 million minus 25. So I think when I started in the libertarian movement in 1964, 63, somewhere in there, nobody mentioned libertarianism. The New York Times, the, uh, the, the, they never mentioned libertarianism. And, and if, if they were thinking of it, they would confuse it with librarianism or libertinism <laughs> or, or something like that. I think part of the reason that in the New York Times and the Washington Post and in the uh, National Post and all these other places, they mention libertarianism and they spell it correctly is due to the libertarian party in both countries. Every time we libertarians get more votes than the difference between the two major parties in the US, people start talking about libertarianism. Well, if we're gonna make any inroads, we have to have people talk about libertarianism and pronounce it correctly and spell it correctly. <laughs> and I think that part of the uh, credit for that is due to the libertarian party. Yeah, look, let me, you know, I feel like I, Walter Block just is doing my job for me right now and saying that you should vote libertarian. Um, and, and yes, I, I wanna say this, like your vote for a libertarian party or, or a principle is not a wasted vote. In fact, it's the only way to not waste your vote, right? Because it, it, voting any against your principles or compromising your principles is, is in a sense voting against your, your principles. Now with, with a libertarian vote, um, 
you, your vote matters because, you know, even if we only get 2 or 3%, it does a few things. It sends a political market signal. Sometimes, like Walter said, it's the difference between uh, being kingmaker and people have to pay attention. Um, and it, it encourages your candidate. Like, what, we only get 20 votes. Uh, it's pretty discouraging. I, I remember when I ran in my first election, I halfway thought that I was going to win. Like I, everyone thought my ideas were the best. I knew my ideas were the best. Everyone was cheerleading me. I was getting, ma I made international news. I was on Fox and CNN. This hour is 22 minutes was making fun of me. Um, I was like, man, I'm really on this upward trend. And then when the final tally came in, I got like 3% of the vote. I was just shattered. Right. But then I realized, you know, like 700 people or something like that went out of their way. They got in their vehicle and they drove and they went to the polls and cast a vote for me. They knew I wasn't going to win. They knew I wasn't going to become the member of parliament, but they voted their principle. That encouraged me to keep going. And so when you give your vote you, you, to us, you're, you're encouraging us to keep going. You're sending a signal to other guys. And listen, we've had lots of success. I, th I think that you know, my case for radicalism is pretty sound because, look, Maxime Bernier almost won leadership of the Conservative Party of Canada because libertarians supported him. He, he sectioned himself off and identified himself essentially as the libertarian candidate. You had Kelly Leach, the populist, you had Andrew Scheer, the centrist, and then you had Maxime Bernier, who was branded himself as a libertarian candidate. Now, why did he almost win? It's because there was a bunch of libertarians out there supporting him. And why were there a bunch of libertarians? Because there was radicals out there promoting this message, even if they were only getting 2 or 3% of the vote. And that created enough libertarians to support Max Bernier. So, uh, so your vote matters big time. Like, if you're just one of those 700, that's a way bigger difference than being one in the 20,000 that vote for the guy who wins. Oh, just uh, just uh, one final thing, and this is in this is in lieu of the uh, of the painting, and the, the the election results. Did you really think that anybody anybody other than Fidel Castro's daughter was going to get in? Um, <laughs> did have uh, one specific thing in events that we were going to do. Um, Victor, you had a painting that you were going oh, to be... Oh, no, that's what we were going to Oh, you cancel that? Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. All right. Uh, was there are additional questions? I yes, sir. Say on the, on the uh, blank ballot, I've often thought it's the closest thing we have to none of the above, you know, which it, is certainly. a libertarian yeah. kind of concept, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. that you, you should be able to vote. We want none of these guys, but not voting is the closest you can come. And I wanted to say to you, Tim, First time ever on the provincial level, I was able to finally vote libertarian when I came to Vancouver and we had a libertarian candidate on the provincial level. And I voted knowing full well yeah. that they wouldn't win, but it was like, yeah, that's what I want to vote. Excellent. I finally yeah. can. Yeah, and at least that vote, you know, your, your spoiled ballot, no one knows at the end of the day. And they know, no one knows why you spoiled it. But if you vote libertarian, that goes in the public record. Everyone sees that someone voted libertarian and uh, and that people start to take notice. So. But of course, when you don't have a libertarian that candidate, yeah. then maybe the uh, blank vote is the closest you can get to. And you can get maybe. to a level where you'd be courted by the mainstream media, maybe, right? Yeah, but maybe. Yeah. Right. And you had a question, sir. Sure, I do. So um, I guess this is more for uh, Mr. Walter Fox. Uh, you're talking about founding principles of libertarianism, private property, locking private property rights. And uh, I had a discussion recently with a uh, communist. And uh, basically, his question was okay, libertarians believe in the NAP. Uh, why? What, what's the underlying premise of the NAP? And people said property rights, some people said uh, consent, and I said, well, I think it's uh, self-ownership. I think that's the, the underlying principle that you own yourself, therefore you own your labor, et cetera, et cetera. And then he's like, okay, well, why do you own yourself? What's the reasoning behind that? Why are you even ownable? Maybe you're not property. Maybe you're uh, something else, right? So how do, you, how do you address someone who doesn't even agree that you own yourself? Well, let me answer it in two ways. Uh, the first way, Imagine a, an Indian teepee where you have 20-foot um, sticks and they meet at the top and then maybe two or three feet is uh, sticking out above. Well, where they meet is uh, the non-aggression principle. And what's below that are the implications of it. What are our views on this? What are our views on immigration? What are our views on abortion, on minimum wage, whatever. But what's up, up here is what is the justification of it in the first place? And there are four or five or six of them. Ayn Rand, don't ask, she says A is A. That's how you deduce the non-aggression principle. 
There's the religious group. God said so. God said, you know, behave or something like that. Uh, they're a natural law. It's sort of a fitting for mankind to uh, have the non-aggression principle. Um, Hans Hoppe had a, an excellent one, the argument from argument. Argumentation ethics. Ar argumentation ethics. Uh, you know, I, I criticized Hans on, um, what was it, uh, immigration, but I think he's a brilliant a genius of a libertarian, and I certainly uh, like his book on uh, democracy, the God had failed, and, and I'm a big fan of his um, um, uh, argumentation ethics. And what he says there is, look, if you want to get at the truth, you have to... Um, uh, be compatible, the only way to get at anything is through argument. Well, how do you have an argument? Well, if, if I punch you in the nose for disagreeing, that's not an argument. So uh, if, if we're going to have an argument to get at the truth, John Stuart Mill says the, on liberty, the only way to get to the truth is by dialogue. Well, then I can't punch you in the nose, you can't punch me in the nose, so we're getting close to the non-aggression principle. The other answer I would give is Murray used to say there are only three ways we can do this. One, we each own ourselves. The other is, nobody owns anybody. Well, if you don't own anybody, you have no right to, you just put your hand over near your mouth. You have no right to do that. You don't own that body, so cut it out and stop breathing, by the way. And we all die. And the third one is, we each own one seven billionth of everybody. Well, if we each own one seven billionth of everybody, again, you, you can't put your hand over here because you have to get a vote. In other words, we all die. Well, if we all die, we're not going to have any philosophical problems. So you, you, <laughs> you have to reject non-ownership, and you have to reject we all own one seven billionth of everybody. And the only other one is each person owns himself. So that would be the, a, a, a second way of answering that question. There's proximity-based ownership, too. <laughs> Hey, uh, just a quick follow-up on that, if I may. Uh, I don't know if the energy is permitting things like that. Just to, just, just kind of like in a very quick nutshell, just to solve this whole A is A business. Okay, maybe I can teach Walter something. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, this whole thing about like where everybody dies, everybody dies if you do this, 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 and this, and there's here's the one right answer, property rights, you know, in the sense of the flourishment of human activity that we survive and survive happily, the pursuit of happiness is that you have to have a standard to ethics. And what is that standard? It is human life, because we have a volitional consciousness. We don't fight tooth, tooth, and, tooth and claw with any great feat of physical uh, strength. It all comes down to this noodle in our head. That's the means of su survival. So to own yourself, and maybe it was just a case of being a semantic quarrel, I don't know, right? But this whole, you, you own yourself. No, you are the actor. You're the, you're the volitional spirit in, the, in this case, in this flesh that has to move. And, and move about. What, and what's the standard of you moving about and doing things and producing and interacting with each other is the, the flourishment of your own life. That is what individual rights is uh, based on. That is the A is A. That's identifying the nature of human beings as ex distinguished from all other living for, uh, forms. And we need to be left alone to flourish, to survive. And on the political, and that's, that's a personal ethic. You would need ethics. You need a system of ethics on a deserted island you know, and in terms of so far as ethics deals with a code of conduct, you know, so maybe a good rule of thumb for that code of conduct would be to use your reason to survive. That has a great deal of ethical import. So you transport to it to a society, individual just rights just means you leave everybody else alone who's trying to do the same goddamn thing. You don't use force against them. So that's self-ownership. That's property rights. That's individual rights. All right, well, thank you again, everybody. Thanks. All right, thank you all for coming out. That will be our last question.